Hello folks and welcome to what I'm hoping is going to be a rather exciting video because we are going to be doing a teardown of EK's new 1390 Founders Edition Limited Edition water block. And this is quite a special block indeed, so there should be an awful lot to see in there. Now, it's taken a bit of a while to get this video going because not only are 3090s very scarce on the ground, uh, these only just started shipping out in the last few weeks. So you'll see them floating around on Reddit and all that now. Uh, I had mine about the same time as everyone else's. But the problem is I also needed to make sure that my card was ready and this was inside a system and this is the only 3090 that I've got. This is my personal one. So this was busy actually doing proper work. So I had to find a time when I can take this down and then fit a block to it so we can do a little bit of testing and still be able to use it afterwards. So finding that time has been a little bit tricky, but we're there now. I'm going to be taking a look at how this fits to this and how it all works. Now I just want to say before we get into the nitty gritty that I don't really classify this as a product review as such. It is indeed a teardown and there will be review elements to it. But for me, the basis of a proper review is you need to be able to compare it with like products. And I don't actually have any other blocks to hand, nor do I have much of an interest in installing them onto the card and getting them because that's not really what this setup is for. Uh, ultimately, I want to be able to use this card and I want to use this block and I want to be able to make the most of this particular block in a mod. So to that extent, I don't think it'll make a particularly good review. Also, I'm not going to be going into some of the additional details that you might want. For instance, being able to compare the um, memory temperatures on the front of the card versus the back. Uh, there are also things like flow restriction. I'm not going to be measuring that. So I think those sorts of measurements are better suited for someone like Steve at Gamers Nexus who has access to all the hardware and his dedicated parts for those sorts of uses. So for me, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be focusing on the block itself and just taking a look at how it was made, some of the choices behind the different elements and what they maybe offer. So to that extent, you've been warned, that is what's gonna feature in this video. So first things first, let's get this block unpacked and I can walk you through what it comes with. So in terms of what's inside the box, it's fairly straightforward. We have the GPU block itself. You have all your mounting screws and thermal paste. Notably, we have two plugs in there along with two Allen keys. We have the handy little EK tool for tightening the plugs your thermal pads, and interestingly here, an additional terminal. So you'll notice the big thing about this block is that the terminals are on the ends. And this is really interesting because it makes use of the curious PCB shape of the 39 to Founders Edition. What they've done is they've added an additional terminal here, and this allows you to have a few different arrangements. So this is actually quite convenient because most likely in my test setup, I'm gonna to have to be using this terminal, which allows you to have a sort of a more traditional arrangement, but on the ends versus the straight out of the uh, end of the card that you get over here. Now we flip the card over, you have a back plate as well. Now stock, the cards don't come like this. This is the silver backplate. Normally, if you buy a silver card, you get one of these, which is a black backplate, and that fits like so. Now, one of the interesting things about this particular backplate design is that it has a contact point over here. And the idea here is that this is in contact with the cold plate from the inside to offer sort of a more advanced form of passive cooling. So whilst this is not an active backplate, there's no water which flows through this section over here, what you will have is water flowing through the cold plate here, which comes into contact with this part of the back plate. The idea there being if this gets very, very hot from the memory on the back, then it's going to be cooled down a little bit by the contact in this part of the card. And we'll, I guess, be able to find out if that actually does anything later on. Now to best understand, I think, why I like the concept of this particular block so much, we have to take a look at the 3090 Founders Edition itself. So the stock cooler, personally, I think this is the most beautiful Founders Edition card that Nvidia has produced. In fact, this is probably my favorite looking GPU cooler of all time. I think it's just astoundingly beautiful and a feat of industrial design, if I'm honest. The proportions are just absolutely wonderful and the heft and solidity, everything about this particular cooler feels special. And it's difficult to portray exactly how different uh, 
it feels to every other card that I've ever used pretty much. Even more interesting to think that this is probably the cheapest of all the 1390s as well because if you get this one at uh, MSRP you're looking at $14.99 or $15.99 uh, depending on where you're from. So it's actually remarkably good value as well. So considering you get this incredibly solid well-made cooler um, it's almost a shame to remove it and put on a water block. So to that extent, I feel any water block that has to replace this stock cooler has to be pretty special. And I think EK thought the same thing. So what they've gone and done is instead of just creating a block that fits, which is all well and good, they've thought things through in a slightly different way and tried to make use of a lot of the characteristics found on this card. So namely, the funky PCB. So you've probably seen the PCB layout of a 3090 Founders Edition and the same thing goes for the 3080. Uh, they have an interesting V cutout for this cooler design. Now, if you're adventurous, that gives you quite a few different possibilities to be able to populate that space. And that's what EK and a few others have done. So rather than have the ports on the ends here, so on the side, now this is where you'd normally find your ports, by putting them on the end here, they've actually made fantastic use of that sort of V cutout here. Now for me, the cool thing about that is that this is a very tall card. I mean, if you look at how far it extends above the PCIe bracket, that's quite a hefty card. And all the cards of that size do have one issue when you start putting them into regular size chassis in that as soon as you put terminals on top of here as well, suddenly your card is incredibly tall. And actually a lot of mainstream chassis have problems with that. There were definitely issues with the uh, Lianli uh, O11D, for instance, with the side glass getting very close to particularly tall cards. So actually having the ports over here is quite interesting. Now, personally, the reason I want to have the ports in the end is to be able to mod it. The issue with having them up here is that it causes the car to go up and down a lot, and actually it's quite difficult to integrate it into things like distro plates and side panels. Having them on the ends actually provides a fair bit more uh, flexibility in that regard. So that's going to be quite interesting, and I'm actually really looking forward to giving that a go later on when I can finally get around to working with this beast. But having them on the ends also provides an interesting idea for the future, which is integrating with distro plates in front. One thing that manufacturers do have the potential to do when you put the ports on the front like this is actually control exactly where the ports are in the, in the chassis. So to illustrate this point, when you have a GPU and it's sitting on the motherboard, where this slot is determined is always by the ATX specification. It's actually always going to be in predetermined slots. You know exactly where it will be on the motherboard. The problem is that the height of the card can change. And that means if you're designing a distro plate, when you've got to put ports in certain locations, you've kind of got to take into account how far your terminal is going to be sitting from the motherboard. Now, sure, that is under control from people like EK and Bitspower and AlphaCool, but only to the extent that they could basically make them the same size as the largest card on the market and have them all in the same position. But the issue with doing that, of course, is you end up with massive blocks on tiny cards, which isn't really ideal either. Now, if you put the ports on the ends here, that does actually mean you can have a bit more control as to whereabouts they sit away from the motherboard. And in theory, that could be really interesting. And with distro plates being so popular as they are now, I can see a few people making use of that in the future. So I'll be looking forward to seeing if anything comes out of that in future card revisions. But we now need to take this thing apart and see what ticks on the inside. Okay, so with everything all neatly laid out like so, I've got a couple issues that I want to flag with you quite early on. 
So, first up, I am missing a screw. That's quite a big deal if you ask me, and I double checked. No, I did not lose the screw. In fact, you might be able to see it in my prior B-roll. That screw is missing. And I took that B-roll straight after removing it from the pack, which means it wasn't there from the factory. So I'm not entirely sure how that got past the QC, but in any case, it wasn't installed. Now it does say that this was leak tested. It's got the sticker on it. The thing is, you can be fine without one screw potentially, but most of these, or at least a good percentage of them, were so loose that actually they were wiggling around in their threads. And that has me quite worried because sure, it might have limped through the testing, but quite honestly, that just didn't seem good enough to me. And I'm, I have the impression that it's because they were all sequentially talked up. And then the problem is when you do it like that, it actually pushes the plastic or whatever you're pushing together into the O-ring, which actually creates a gap. Now, the issue there is that you end up with uneven pressure around and you actually can end up with leaks just because things aren't evenly pressed together. I've had this issue with distro plates before, so I end up having to go through a couple times to make sure everything is fully torqued down and snug. But in any case, if you're installing one of these yourself, just always get into the habit of double checking things like the screws because stuff can come from the factory not as intended and you have to try and check that out because believe me it's a lot easier just to go through and double check your screws than it is to have to go through the rigmarole of trying to get components fixed or having weird leaks and spending time making sure that all the coolant's gone and so forth. At the end of the day it's your computer you're going to want to double check these things in advance EK will do what they can, but it's up to you to double check things as well. So with that all said and done, I think we should start by having a look at this chonking big piece of aluminium because it really is very thick indeed. In fact, it's of the order of about 25 millimeters. Let's take a look. Okay, so it's in the region of 26.5 millimeters thick. That is ridiculous. That means prior to machining, this whole thing must have been about maybe 30 millimeters or so, even thicker or thinner, depending on how they've done it. But either way, that's a lot of aluminium. And this is a lot of material to remove. I mean, if we take a look at it, we've got this huge pocket over here. We've got all this milling on the inside. There's lots of different threads at different heights. We've got chamfers and edge breaks on all the insides over here. We've also got this large LED contour, and that requires a very thin tool with a very long neck and potentially even um, a different shaped sort of geometry just to get past this part over here. That's a big job. There's an awful lot to do in there. And then also we have to consider we've got engraving on this side, we've got threads on this side. So depending on how many axes the machine that made this has, this could be an awful lot of operations. That's quite interesting. And then on top of that, we have all the finishing. So these were finished in a similar manner to the satin torque fittings. And I really like it. It's a sort of media blasted or media tumbled finish. And it's very even, but still incredibly metallic. I think it's more interesting than painting or some of the other finishes that I've seen applied to blocks. And I think the aluminium really works with this, especially since it's gonna wrap around the PCB. You won't have any of the edges showing. I think that's a very neat solution. Now, talking about neat solutions, here we have the RGB, and this is quite interesting as well. So the single strip wraps around the outside here, past the terminal, and then flows around the acrylic like so. So that way, we're gonna have lovely effects that can go all the way around the acrylic like so, and it will be consistent with the terminal as well. And I think that's a nice touch. Now, if there's one thing that maybe I would have preferred is if, instead of going around this side, perhaps if the LEDs had gone around this side, mostly because that's the front. So it's either gonna be visible like so or vertically, in which case that will be on the top. And then that just makes it a little bit more diffuse. But at the end of the day, that's splitting hairs. And in, if it's much easier to make it this way, then it's a better decision, quite frankly. Now, one of the interesting things about this is how it interfaces with the acrylic. Because if we take a look at this acrylic panel, it's very clear, and it's clear because it hasn't had to be machined. I think this is a very clever solution. 
So what they've done here is they've machined on the outside, and this has got this basically this rim here, which interfaces with this part in the aluminium shroud. Now the clever thing there is they don't means they don't need to drill any holes, they don't have any threads or anything in the acrylic itself. And that makes this bit, at least for EK, much easier to produce, more consistent. You're not gonna have to worry about tool wear and things as much. And also, there's a very interesting reason why they might want to do this, and that comes in the form of the jet plate. So if we take a look at the cold plate here, for a start, this thing is huge. I mean, sure, it's not that long because the actual Founders Edition PCB isn't very long, but it is incredibly thick. I mean, this thing weighs an absolute ton. This whole block assembly is a probably a, about 1.75, 1.8 kilograms in weight. And if we take a look at the thickness of this cold plate, that's a solid 10 millimeters thick at the minimum. If we take into account the thicker parts here, all the way up to the top, yeah, you know, we're looking at 12, 13 millimeters thick of solid copper. And that's been um, then nickel plated on top of that. I think it's a really beautiful piece. The machining on this side, I think is absolutely wonderful. Um, obviously there are kind of, you know, little swirlies every so often, but that's just always going to be the case with a, a mass produced product like this. You're always gonna see the odd thing here and there. And actually, I think it looks really nice. On the other side, uh, there's some interesting decisions here. So obviously we've got ourselves a trachoidal toolpath here, very efficient, sort of what you normally expect to see. Um, I'm not so impressed by this. So rather than going over with a tool using say a parallel toolpath, they've, they've just used a sort of a pocket one over here. Um, I don't really like that because you can see that's quite a large sort of spiral we got here. And I can actually feel that with my finger. I'd have preferred if they just went straight like so. The problem here is that when you do a spiral, you can get dwell marks. And I've got a bigger one there, and I've got another one there and there. And then when they all intersect, you've got yourself a little kind of raised point. And I think that's quite a bad place to have one because that's the GPU die. It doesn't seem like a good idea to use that particular toolpath just for this section. I mean, look at these memory module sections. They're lovely, they're really smooth, and they've just had a piece go all the way over across all of them. These are fantastic. But the most important one of all, is a bit rough. Uh, I find that a little bit disappointing. I don't think it's going to affect the thermals really. I mean, I, maybe if you were doing some crazy level of overclocking like how uh, apparently Jay, when he was doing his um, LN2 overclocking had issues with the text within the die itself. But you know, we're not doing that. That's not the idea here. So I don't really think that's gonna be much of a problem, but it's still a little bit of an odd choice. Interestingly though, as I mentioned, we've got ourselves the jet plate assembly. Now what they've done differently here is that this is all sunk in quite far. So for a start, that's quite a difficult thing to mill. It's probably used a slitting saw, which goes all the way and does all those uh, little fins. But to prevent them from having to use a really thick piece of acrylic and then machine it all away, what they've done here is very clever. You have a jet plate. This is a bi-directional jet plate. So you can go from either in or out. It won't really matter. The direction shouldn't change anything. And then you have these little inserts. So these are made out of acrylic as well, and they look as if they've been laser cut. And these slot like so. Now the clever thing about doing it like this is that this basically keeps this whole assembly um, separate. You don't need to have it all machined, which means you're not gonna have any machining marks, tool wear problems or anything on this side of acrylic. It means you can use thinner acrylic. It's not gonna be as expensive. So from a production value, that's quite an interesting thing. And actually it's a better solution. Now Bits Power has done something similar to this before using an injection molded insert, which goes around the outside over here. Uh, and it's just, a, I think a clever use of a fairly basic technology in this case to do a job that actually just better than if you were to mill that entirely. Cause now this is completely clear. We're not gonna have any issues with diffusion or light kind of bouncing off in lines or anything because of the solution. So I think that's quite neat. Now, another feature of this cold plate that I quite like is how the coolant gets in. So when you have the terminal, the terminal interfaces over here into the cold plate itself. So on a lot of older EK blocks, you'll find that the uh, terminal goes into the acrylic. The problem here is that acrylic cracks. 
and terminals can often be under a lot of stress, especially during transit. Now, if you're hoping to ship your system, it can be a little bit risky, and I've actually had blocks break this way before. I've had the acrylic completely shear out from the screws. It's exceedingly rare, but it can happen, and once it happens to you, you sort of never trust it again. So here, the threads go all the way into the cold plate itself. There are none in this acrylic, and there's none in that acrylic, all in copper. Now, one thing I did find a little bit interesting was how short and stubby these screws are. So we've got these sort of shoulder screws, which are nickel plated, and these go through the terminal like so. Now there are three screws, which is nice to see. But if we look on this side, they only go through about two millimeters and there's quite a large chamfer on these as well as an edge break. So actually we've got absolutely tiny thread engagement there. So you just want to be very careful when you're installing this that you don't end up accidentally stripping the copper threads here. It's probably quite difficult to do that, being honest, but it could still happen. Uh, just be careful. There's actually quite a bit of thread in this cold plate, so I'm surprised they made them quite so short. I think maybe if they'd added just another couple millimeters or so on there, make me a little bit more comfortable, but it's largely not going to be a problem, I imagine. One little detail that's nice is that it does come with a single slot bracket. So obviously the original one is a triple slot, so with a smaller card like this, it would be an absolute waste. I think maybe I'd have preferred a double slot, but single slot will be absolutely fine, I'm sure, and probably works out better for some of the other smaller chassis that they've got in mind for this anyway. Now the last major detail are these, which are the back plates. So obviously mine was a silver block, so it actually would come with a black one stock. Likewise, if you got the black one, you'd have a silver. So I've requested a silver one to match up with it. Personally, I'd have much preferred if they just shipped with the silver one. I think most people would have done. They're now offering both, but I, I don't really see why I'd have wanted a, a black back plate with a silver block personally. Maybe one or a few people would have preferred that, but I think honestly, I just would have gone with this. The interesting design decision here is they've gone with this sort of ribbed look. And this is interesting because I guess it not only increases the surface area, so the cooling potential of the back plate, but it sort of mirrors the um, cooling fins that you find on the stock cooler. So it actually looks really quite interesting. When you put them next to one another, you can see how the design cues from one lead into the other. Now, the interesting thing about this one is that this is like a hybrid design. So this plate over here interfaces with the cold plate. So you use a little bit of thermal paste on here. And the idea there being, if this gets really, really toasty, hopefully it should be cooled down a little bit by the cold plate itself. So it's not gonna be just a pure passive solution. It's a sort of a hybrid. It's not active. It doesn't have coolant flowing over this part itself. But EK are thinking that this little piece here will add a little bit more cooling potential to the plate. I guess later on we'll be able to find out if that actually is the case or not. But in any case, they did think about it. I'm not sure if this is there on the 3080 block or not. Might be, might not. Doesn't have memory modules on the back, so I'm not sure how this interfaces in the same way. But it's quite interesting that they thought of it at all. Now this all sits behind, I think, a rather nice little feature, which is this surround. And this is just an aesthetic piece. It helps clamp down onto the cool plate section. And I just really like the fact that they've done this at all. I think that's a neat solution. It gets rid of some of the visible lines and screws. And I think it keeps it very neat and in keeping with the original cooler. Now, lastly, before we get to installing this thing, I just want to have a quick chat about thermal pads. So these are the ones that EK provides and they are all one millimeter. Now for a start, that's nice. I like only having one size of thermal pad to deal with. It makes it a lot easier to replace them, that's for sure. Um, but at the same time, I can see installation is going to be a bit of a faff with these. I mean, you can see how many there are in there. There's an awful lot of parts on this PCB that are going to be cooled by these. So it would have been nice to see more pre-prepared ones. Uh, yeah, okay, it's not a big deal, but it is quite an expensive block. So maybe that would have been a nice little luxury to see more of, especially since other blocks at cheaper price points do have pre-applied thermal pads nowadays. But that said, I'll survive. You only need to do this sort of once anyway. It's not going to be a huge deal. 
Now, some people have been trying out different thermal pads because they've said that these ones aren't as thermally conductive as they should be, really. Um, I don't really know how to feel about that at the moment because I've not used them. I'll give them a try, but um, it's difficult to tell because the quality of the information coming out online is a little bit variable. So some people have been saying, oh, it makes no difference. And other people have been mysteriously knocking off 30 degrees from their um, thermal junction temperatures on the memory. And the lack of consistency, quite frankly, is a bit difficult for me to work with. And I don't really know what I can say in this video since I haven't decided to do some big thermal pad showdown. In any case, all I'd say is install these, see how they work. If you're having issues, then consider replacing them. I mean, there's not really much more else that I can say about that. EK thinks they're fine. I'm gonna go with them, see how they go. And if my temperatures are nice and low anyway, I don't see what the fuss is gonna be. If the temperatures are very close to those of the standard cooler, uh, well, maybe there'll be something to be said there. Well, with that all said and done, it's now time to take this bad boy apart. I have never done one of these ones before and it looks a little bit daunting if I'm honest. Wish me luck. Fingers crossed it will all go smooth. Now I think you'll agree, that is something rather special indeed. Now I've got to admit, for the most part, installing this was pretty straightforward. Sure, taking apart the cooler is a little bit fiddly thanks to having to deal with all the magnets and tabs and everything, but uh, actually I think I prefer doing this generation's one to the last one because they used to have all those annoying hex standoffs on the inside and it would just take absolutely ages. So as long as you know what to do, actually the current gen coolers are a little bit easier and the PCB is much simpler. There's only a handful of screws in this whole assembly. Now the EK block doesn't come with a manual, or at least mine didn't. You'll have to download it from uh, their website. I'm personally okay with that. I don't actually like having the manuals. They all just get recycled instantly. So I'd rather just download them via a QR code or on their manual website. Um, I know some people prefer the manuals, but it's just worth noting that in case you don't have it in the box, that's what you have to do. But installing it, pretty straightforward, fairly similar to any other block if you've installed a GPU water block before. One thing though, there's a huge number of thermal pads that you have to cut for all this block. Now, I don't know how necessary all of them are, but I just decided that all of them should be necessary. They're all in the instructions. So I followed it to a T and it just takes a very long time. Some of them are really tiny and you have to cut the big pads up into little squares and put them on and then just removing the film. That, that alone took longer than even applying the pads. So with all that said and done, hopefully I don't have to take this off and reseat it or anything because those are a bloody nightmare. Still, if we only have to do it once, I can live with it. Now obviously it's not much good just having a GPU sitting here on the surface plate, it doesn't really tell us anything. We need a test setup. So for that, we're gonna be using my current personal system setup in a rather interesting chassis. Now, if you haven't seen one of these behemoths before, this is an Inwin Yong. And in my opinion, it is one of the most interesting chassis that has been released in recent years. Now, the reason for that is not so much the crazy form itself, but the fact that this whole exterior is 3D printed 
And moreover, the structure is designed by a process called generative design, in which you input a bunch of load-bearing statistics and points, and then it constructs a chassis based around a set of equations and ideas. And I think that's a really interesting technology. However, it's a bit beyond the scope of this review. So why have I got this here? Well, I've actually had the hardware from Aquacaris just sitting in it the whole time as I've been using it, because it does actually make a fairly decent test benchy type system. I can access everything quite easily because it doesn't have lots of sides or anything, it's just a shell. And for that reason, actually, it's been quite a practical chassis for me to use in the meantime. Now there is one issue though, this huge thing only supports one 360mm radiator as standard. Um, obviously that's not going to be enough. I've got a 360 on the back here already, and that's just for the CPU. And we're going to need to have a little bit more oomph because the 3090 obviously draws an awful lot of power. So why have I chosen a case that doesn't fit a well any more radiators than it already has inside? Surely that would be an awful decision. Well. The issue here is actually I don't have any cases that fit enough radiators for both the CPU and the GPU. You kind of want to have a minimum of two 360s really for comfortable operation. So um, I don't actually have any cases that fit that alongside the size of the hardware that I've got. So I thought it would be kind of fitting for the channel at least if we just mod one to make it work. And to that extent, this is what I'm going to be doing to it. This is a 480mm hardware labs radiator, and I've 3D printed some brackets on the back here that will allow me to attach it to the Yong, and I'll just show you how I'll do that in a second. So the whole exterior of this chassis connects via six main points to the internal chassis, and the exterior is also further divided into two sections. So we have a lower half, and then we have the top half. Now the cool thing here is if we remove the top half, You can see there are two handy mounting points up here. Now this is how the top half normally connects to the chassis. And I figured actually that would be quite a good place to put an additional radiator. So I've got this 480 millimeter beast. And then my 3D printed brackets basically just slot in exactly where the regular chassis would normally go. Now I don't mind running this personally without the top. As nice as it looks with it, it doesn't really change anything. So I don't mind just putting that somewhere else and in the meantime running with this sort of janky interesting setup, but it should work rather well. Now, obviously it goes without saying that when you're testing a water block, you're sort of testing your radiators at the same time. Um, so obviously if you have a lot of radiator space, then even a kind of a poor block can actually perform quite well. So that's why I don't really want to benchmark it um, purely from a block perspective, because actually the whole setup matters. I just want this because 480 millimeters is a good amount of radiator space, and that will be plenty for the 3090 to run full pelt, as long as my mounting is good and as long as the block is good. So now that I've introduced the test chassis, I'm going to tear down parts of this and incorporate this new radiator and the GPU back into the loop, and we'll be able to get some proper test figures. <laughs> 
So I've gone and run the tests, and I think I've got some rather interesting data out of all this. Now, before assembling the uh, system as it is, I did some testing on air to make sure that we had a bit of a benchmark to compare against. Now, obviously, this is going to perform a lot better. It's water-cooled. But I want to see if there are any interesting trends on the air card that maybe aren't present on the water-cooled one. So let's kick things off with some performance figures. Now, to get the data, I took measurements before doing the benchmark, 10 minutes in and 20 minutes in, just in case there are any differences between the 10 and 20 minute mark. In terms of which benchmarks, I chose Fermark, running it at 4K and eight times anti-aliasing, along with Port Royal to represent more of a gaming workload, just to see if there are any differences perhaps in the memory handling for that one. And just in case the stress test nature of Fermark pushes things in a sort of unrealistic manner. Kicking off, we have the results for the air-cooled card. Now, the thing that's quite interesting here is the card basically runs passive until a workload is put on it. So actually it idles at quite a high temperature. So we had mine at 51.6 degrees Celsius, which is a delta of 26.6 degrees at idle. Now, 10 minutes into Fermark, it rose up to 69.3, which is a 44.3 Celsius delta. Now that's pretty high, but actually, all things considered, it's pretty good. It was quite a quiet card. The interesting thing for me though, is that at 20 minutes, that temperature actually fell down to 66.4, despite the ambient not really changing at all. In fact, the ambient went up a little bit. So the fact that we've now got a 40.4 degree delta is rather interesting. And I think that says a lot about the way that the card handles its power and everything. Similarly, we had a similar trend on the memory front. So it was idling at 60 degrees, and then it went all the way up to 104 degrees 10 minutes into the testing. And that, at 20 minutes, fell down to 100. So I wonder if perhaps actually the clock speed was being limited here in order to reduce the power draw and basically make the card a bit cooler at the same volume level. And that's quite an interesting one. So to check that out, I had a look at the core clock speed. And this was quite telling. So actually it was boosting initially up to 1950 megahertz, but it fell down to about 1890 to 1870. So it was around 1890 when I took the 10 minute test. And then it had actually fallen down to 1850 by 20 minutes. So on average, the clock speed was actually decreasing a bit. After that, it was basically stable. I ran it for a bit longer, but didn't bother taking measurements because they were identical to 20 minutes. But it's interesting that it didn't stay at its upper bound for very long. Now, if we compare that with the water-cooled card, well, firstly, the temperatures are obviously much lower. Now, we had a lower ambient on this testing, but in terms of the delta, originally, it was only 21.7 degrees when it was an idle, that's a delta of 0.7 degrees. So very close to the ambient temperature. And that's largely because everything was quite cold at the time. And then when put under 10 minutes of load, and this is using the quiet fan profile. So I chose the first one being quiet to emulate a little bit what it was like with the air-cooled card. With the quiet profile, it was 48.8 degrees Celsius, which is a delta of 27.6 and that's much much lower and it stayed pretty stable in fact when it went to um, 20 minutes we only had it rise up to 48.8 that's 0.2 degrees celsius well within the realms of uh, error on this one so very stable a 28.8 degree delta pretty good the interesting thing for me though was the clock speed because it remained at a constant 1920 for the first 10 minutes and it actually went up to 1935. So it was boosting in and around that range constantly. It never dropped below 1900 megahertz. And that's quite interesting because the air-cooled card basically only spiked to 1900 and then stayed in the 1800. So it actually was running a little bit faster despite being a lot cooler. Funnily enough, that's how you'd expect the boost function to work. Now, if we take a look at the memory temperatures, I thought this was quite interesting as well. So obviously at idle, it was much lower. If we take a look at the GPU T junction, it was at 30 degrees, very close to ambient. And then this is in the raw figures, it went up to a maximum of 70 degrees by 10 minutes. And then 20 minutes in, it had only risen up a further two degrees to 72, which does actually correspond nicely with the coolant temperature rising by about the same amount. 
The actual measurements seem a little bit suspicious in a way because a lot of the T-junction temperatures are very well rounded at exactly the same figure, so perhaps they're targeting those temperatures. I'm not really sure what's going on in there, but all I know is that it is a solid 30 degrees cooler than on air, and perhaps that's a factor that is leading to the GPU core clock speed to be much higher consistently. For the sake of being thorough, I also ran the same tests with the fans set to maximum speed just to see if it would make much of a difference. It just basically lowered all the temperatures by a couple degrees just because the coolant temperature was a little bit lower. But even then, it was only two degrees, one degree, something like that. Probably quite honestly within the area for the actual coolant measuring probe. So it's not really worth thinking. It's one of the cool things about water cooling that you can run the fans generally a lot slower and still have fantastic cooling. So with a 480 millimeter radiator and a 360 millimeter radiator in here, that's a lot of radiator. So this system runs incredibly quiet because you can run these fans at about 700 RPM and basically have largely the same cooling potential with this particular setup. It's just not enough heat going in to get that temperature of the coolant to rise up substantially when you have any of the fans running. Now, one thing I did find quite interesting was when we swapped over to Port Royal. So on the air-cooled car, the Port Royal temperatures were basically exactly the same as the Furmark ones, basically no difference visible at all. It did sound a little bit different. There was a bit more coil whine, but apart from that, I couldn't really tell the difference. The clock speeds were the same, the temperatures were the same. However, when we swapped to the water-cooled card, the core temperatures largely stayed the same. However, the GPU memory actually fell a lot. So perhaps that's an interesting point there in that the memory isn't being utilized as much in Port Royal as it is in Furmark. So it's not being stressed as hard and so it's not generating as much heat. And that would be interesting if it came across in this test data as to the effectiveness of the cooling available here. So I think that's quite an interesting result. Now, it's fair to say we all knew that this was going to cool much better than an air-cooled car. That's not really up for debate at all. The question was, would there be any trends? And for me, the interesting trend here is that this backplate definitely does a good job of keeping the memory cool. Now, how much of that is down to this sort of active section here that's in contact with the cold plate? I don't really know. I haven't been able to test that. I, it would involve me having to take this off and put maybe an insulator in between the two to basically ruin the thermal contact. My inclination is that it doesn't do a whole lot, but in any case, the fact that this is a solid, pretty hefty backplate with all this ribbing on the backside here, which adds quite a bit of surface area, it, this is going to be a well cooling backplate and it obviously makes good contact with the memory modules and it makes quite a sizable difference. It knocked 30 degrees off or 40 degrees off in some cases from the T-junction temperature. So that's pretty good and in my eyes, fairly conclusive. In any case, I now need to tear this thing down once again and start taking lots of interesting measurements so that I can start modding these things later on, and it should be quite exciting. Now, of course, you wouldn't want to miss any of that now, would you? So if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. There's some fantastic content just around the corner, and our new team member, Andy, is going to be putting out some pretty cool stuff as well. Also, you can find us over on Facebook, Instagram, builds.gg, and Twitter. We also have our Discord server linked below, so pop in, say hi, have a proper chat. It's a fantastic community and there's an awful lot to talk about with everyone. Plus, it's the best place to stay up to date with little bits and bobs and updates and just generally having a fun time with the community. You can also find our merchandise store linked below, so if you want to support the channel, pop in, have a look and see if anything strikes your fancy. Take care, folks. Stay safe. I'll catch you next time.